moment uh, at some point to vote for the top three endangered property nominations so we can know where our priorities should be next year. So these are individual properties. And what we've been talking about at our symposium the last two days and today is really about um, what are the challenges for preservation and, and making neighborhoods livable. Um, we talked about gentrification and how preservation impacts or, or doesn't, um, how neighborhoods change over time. Um, so it's been a really invigorating, uh, challenging week for me personally, and I think for a lot of people that are participating. Um, we're going to hear more of, I think, the challenge today and some big ideas uh, that our speaker, Ned Kaufman, is, is working on. I had drinks from last night, and really, um, it's really uh, inspiring to hear some of the things he's working on that other people aren't. So looking forward to hearing him. Um, before we get started, um, please turn off your cell phones. Um, Notice the fire exits at the rear and the front of the building. The restrooms are downstairs that you came up. Um, I should uh, let you know the sanctuary of the church is open. It's a magnificent place. We're very fortunate to be here this week. And uh, we're fortunate that uh, Bishop Williams and his congregation are preserving this magnificent building for the future. Um, I'd also like to thank our symposium committee, many of whom are here today. Um, our co-chairs, including Catherine Taylor, who's here, and, and Brett Smiley, who is unable to attend. And our sponsors, including the Providence Journal, Providence Journal Charitable Legacy Foundation, AECOM, Alien Properties, Suburban Integrated Facilities Resources, and one of our sponsors for today, which is John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage at Brown University. And we are excited that we have so many Brown students in attendance today. Thank you all for coming. Um, also, thanks to our volunteers who are making this day much easier for our staff, and thanks to the staff, especially Paul Wacker, who has orchestrated this entire program. So today's programs are free of charge, open to the public, thanks to a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, they've been a great partner throughout the year in helping us conceive of uh, the content and also how, um, how to put it together for the public. We are offering um, translation services today thanks for their support. Um, and I just want to give them a round of applause while they do so much for the community. I think this is the 50th year of the National Endowment for the Humanity. So please give them a round. Thank you. 
especially to those who live there. Max Page from the University of Massachusetts says, Ned Kaufman has been at the vanguard of historic preservation thought and activism for two decades. He has challenged preservationists to go beyond a traditional focus on the beautiful buildings and become part of a larger movement for social justice. Dr. Kaufman earned his PhD in architectural history from Yale University. He was a professor at the University of Chicago and Columbia School of Architecture, and he was guest curator of the inaugural exhibition of the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. From 1990 to 2000, Dr. Kaufman was director of historic preservation for the Municipal Art Society of New York, where he led successful campaigns to preserve the African burial ground, the Audubon Ballroom, the south side of Ellis Island, and other projects. He founded and directed Place Matters, the preservation program at Pratt Institute. As a principal of Kaufman Heritage Conservation, Dr. Kaufman is deeply involved in projects related to preservation, policy, education, and public lands. His most recent book is Place, Race, and Story, Essays on the Path and Future of Our Historic Preservation. Michael Hollerman, University of Texas says, preservation use, use, preservationists usually focus on the how. Ned Kaufman reminds us to ask why we are preserving. He thoughtfully answers by showing us how preservation can better connect us and our places through the shared stories of the people's lives. Not only is Dr. Kaufman a scholar and educator, but he, for over two decades, has actively world, worked in the field of nonprofits and social justice organizations. He has traveled extensively with colleagues and students throughout the U.S. and abroad, including Latin America, Cuba, and Mexico. His new major project, which is currently underway, is his next book, Heritage and Social Justice in the 21st Century America. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman, for speaking to us today. We are eager to learn how we can prepare for our future. And now, please help me welcome Dr. Ned Kaufman. Starting right here, the Winnesco Tucket River. 
her. And, and, if, and if you want to make help, I've had a close cut. <laughs> And, and, when, and if you feel a little bit, you know, kind of edgy, just say clean it or <laughs> chop this. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you want to kind of lighten up, how about moose up valley uh, or rum stick neck, coconut cassock, papa squat. <laughs> These are beautiful names, but what a box it. I think that's the most beautiful. That's beautiful thing. That, that's a Hawaiian look to it. But I decided that my favorite is Yalu. Since discovering Yalu, I have found that when, when I need to cheer myself up, I, I found the same Yalu a couple of times. So, so this is this is really a heritage to me. But it but it um, it makes us. But as we treasure that heritage, we it we, we, it provokes us also to ask. Um, what, what, the question that's on um, this slide here, what is our heritage? And this conference has done a wonderful job, I think, of expanding our understanding of the answer to that question, what our, what our heritage is. And I'm going to try to expand it a little more, so, so stay with me and, and we'll, see, we'll see if we can do that. It's another wonderful piece of uh, element of heritage that Rhode Island has. It, uh, maybe, maybe no mountains, but that fantastic uh, coast ground, all, all that water in the foreground, from from Narragansett all the way up to, to the Bay up to Providence, uh, down through Newport, around the coast of Massachusetts, Fall River to New Bedford, and, and out uh, onto the Cape. You have thousands of miles of coastline folded into uh, in, into a very short uh, space on the map. It's a deeply indented. It's the polar opposite from the coastline of, say, California. And there's a reason for that. It, it is the polar opposite of California. Um, California's coastline is rising. And Rhode Island's coastline is sinking. The reason it has all those indentations is that that's the mark of bays and rivers that are slowly drowning. Under, uh, under the ocean. Which brings us to the, the themes that I want to explore with you today. The theme of Providence is a kind of island, um, but, it, but an island that's part of an archipelago, a series of archipelagos defined by the anxieties not only of where we are, but also of the moment we're in. Uh, and that's where the view from 2015 uh, becomes really important. Now, I plan to talk today about three different kinds of archipelagos. Global warming, um, poverty and inequality, and the demographic changes, the, the, the tremendous surge of immigration and of cultural diversity, which are transforming our, our society. Um, but I'm only going to talk about the first two. And the reason is not just time. It's also that um, however much anxiety is involved associated with uh, with, with the surge in cultural diversity and all the cultural change and that, that that brings. There's also so much that's good about it. And there's nothing good that can be said about global warming or, or poverty. They're just plain serious problems that we need to address. So I want to keep that distinction really clear. And that, so that's why I'm going to talk only about the, the, uh, the two today. Um, so my theme today is, it, it's not just anxiety, but it's also urgent problems that, that, we, that we should be anxious about. It's also about how neighborhood preservation can take on those problems, and about how anxiety can motivate us to do the hard, necessary work of reshaping our preservation vision so that that can be done. Now, at this point, I, you probably already can tell that my talk is going to be a bit different from, uh, from the others that you've heard. And so I want to take a moment to reflect on the, the differences and, and, and on some of what I've learned here at this conference and how it might all fit together. And I think this is something that, that ought to be said uh, by someone out loud, that 
I strongly endorse the direction of this conference, the theme of Beyond Buildings, and the, and the theme which Catherine Taylor mentioned, I think, in her remarks yesterday, of uh, moving beyond our comfort level in preservation. I think, that, I think this is absolutely the right direction to go. And so I want to, I want to recognize um, the work that, that Brent and Paul and the staff have done and, and the, the program committee and the board. And, and, and the reason I think that's important is that this is, there's a risk involved in going outside our comfort level. I think in the long run, this is a winning bet. I think this is where things are going to go, where they need to go. But in the short run, there's a lot of risk. There's a need to maintain a base of support from us in the preservation movement that uh, to get through this, this transition from the moment where these are very difficult ideas to the moment in the, sometime in the future when they'll be broadly accepted. So, um, so, so I think we need to look for ways to, to, to move these ideas forward and to support organizations like um, like the Providence Preservation um, Society that, that are courageous enough to take them on and start showing the direction that we need to go. So I think Beyond Buildings is right. I also, I, I love the theme of neighborhoods. And we've heard um, uh, profound uh, and inspiring stories, profound information and inspiring stories about work in the neighborhood, that work that can be done by creative individuals and dedicated groups working at the neighborhood level, uh, analyzing, networking, organizing, cajoling, and harnessing market forces where they can be used in ingenious ways. But I was very struck by a remark that Barbara Sokoloff made uh, in her talk yesterday, that much of the success that had been achieved by dedicated organizations and individuals in the South Side was quote, the result of public policy. We neglect public policy at our peril. Too often we assume that public policy is um, just the way it is. It's not going to get any worse, but there's also nothing we can do to make it better. And um, I think that that's an attitude that we have, we have to change. So I'm going to talk about public policy I'm going to, but but I'm going to talk about public policy at a national level, because I think that the big problems that we're facing, global warming and poverty, cannot be solved by localities. We need we need a national public policy framework to make real progress. And I'm going to suggest that we cannot accept the public policy we have as the status quo, it's now time to change it. We can only, and, and that means public policy, not depending on the market. We can manipulate the market so far, but it's not, it's not going to get us where we need to go. We need something else. So, um, so this is a time uh, that we live in of, of great anxiety, and one symptom of that is a, a broad failure of the core institutions of our society and a deep failure of public trust uh, in those uh, institutions. And that's been, we, that's been uh, rolling along for a while. We saw the financial crisis that, where, where our, our financial institutions let us down and the, the, the foreclosure crisis that that um, caused. We, we've seen an epidemic of corporate malfeasance. On, on, a, on a grandiose scale, General Motors fined a less than a billion dollars for knowing about safety defects that, that killed over 100 people. Volkswagen, um, they falsified the emission state on 11 million cars, and that scandal was getting worse. And then, of course, most recently, the Exxon uh, Mobil revolution. Exxon knew about global warming in the 1970s. Their own scientists figured it out. They not only hid it from the public, but once they figured out what was going on, they lied to the public, mounted a 25-year disinformation campaign. And, and we are going to suffer for that uh, uh, forever, actually. Well, um, the, the, 
collapse of, of trust in institutions is, is not limited to the private sector. Government is failing us too. We, we now have a system of government where not shutting the government down over a disagreement is considered a great legislative achievement. <laughs> From our national government down to agencies in New York State, we, we have major parts of the, of, of the government process in the economy that are functioning without long term, without budgets, or, um, or long term appropriations. This is simply mad. Um, and, and, yet, and, and one could go on. Uh, but the, the point is that despite all of this, or, or I think more correctly because of it, we're also seeing signs of a really hopeful renewal. There's ferment, there's ferment everywhere. It, it's simmering just under the surface. There's ferment on the right uh, with, with the Tea Party movement and the Freedom Caucus. There's ferment on the left. Uh, the, the number of left movements that are that are beginning to crystallize it. Uh, um, it, it it's a very long list. There's the Occupy movement, which is kind of metastasizing all over in a lot of places. There's, uh, there's I Don't Know More. There's the Black Lives Matter movement. There's the Women Wage movement. There's, uh, there's a ferment of activity arising around labor issues and climate issues in places all over the country. So while the times demand that we be anxious, I think we should be looking for ways to be part of that from it, to take the energy of change that I think we're beginning to feel and turn this into a time of renewal. And, and I, think, I think that um, th th there are tremendous threats to us in the present moment, but I think this also offers us a, a, an opportunity greater than we've had, uh, any that we've had in, uh, in a couple of generations. Actually, so all of which brings us back to uh, that, that wonderful coastline of Rhode Island, that sinking coastline of Rhode Island. It's sinking in part because of geological factors, but also, as everyone knows, because of climate change. Now, climate change, as everyone also knows, doesn't mean just rising temperatures. It means rising sea levels. It means acidification, dying coral reefs, epidemics. Um, mass uh, movements of, uh, of climate refugees, and, and so on. Well, the, the sea is the one that concerns us most obviously here. The sea will rise. It will. It's too late to change that. The only question is how much and how fast. And the scientists are still arguing over that. But the predictions tend to, tend to get worse, not better, as more research is done. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at one of uh, 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 the, the great historic places of Rhode Island Newport. This is what a five-foot sea level rise would look like in Newport. Again, no one knows what the amount will be, but this is within the range of uh, uh, sea level rise that experts are uh, thinking could be possible. Well, it, it wipes out um, most of the old work and a chunk of the old part of town. Uh, the water would come up to look out here in, in this slide. Uh, this this uh, lovely 1743 house uh, on the market now for well over a million, it's, it's gone, it's tough. The 1865 Kudnet uh, Mill is restored uh, under about five feet of water. The um, uh, Whitehorn um, House on Town Street, 1811. Uh, the water is lapping at the doorstep. By great good fortune, I learned this morning, that, thanks to uh, thanks to Brent's introduction, uh, of a conference that's going to take place in April, April 10th to 13th, keeping history above uh, above water in Newport. So I, I encourage everyone who's interested to uh, to keep their eye on that. But what's the problem? Here's what a five foot sea level rise does in problems. It's beginning to eat away at downtown. But it's not too bad. Above five feet things get really serious. Oops. <laughs> Here, here's seven feet. Uh, a lot of downtown problems is uh, here's 
here's 10 feet. And this, this is an extreme prediction, but it is within the range of predictions that scientists believe are possible. Well, at 10 feet, you can see um, College Hill is fine, Brown is fine, but the view from College Hill is, it, it's not looking across a little river that you can barely see downtown, it's looking at a swamp, at a sort of tidal marsh with buildings emerging from dirty water and cracked pavement with the water level going up and down with the tides. Well, that, that won't happen. Somebody will do something. But the water is going to rise. So Providence will have to protect itself from, uh, from sea level rise. But the other thing that, that I want to emphasize is that there's something else that Providence needs to do. And not only protect itself, but, but reduce emissions. Reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing the sea to rise. And that's the part we have so much trouble thinking about. We've all gotten used to the idea of protecting ourselves, but the idea that we could actually do something to reduce the problem so we don't have to protect ourselves so much, that's become a little bit harder for all of us to think about. But that's where I think we really should focus. But here's the point. Providence is not alone. Providence is part of an archipelago of cities and regions which are facing the same, the same uh, problem. And I made my very own sort of rough and ready map of what it looks like in the United States. Some of the worst problems, the most severe problems, are um, along the south, the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, coast of New Orleans, obviously, um, Houston, uh, Miami, all the way to parts of North Carolina are very seriously affected, southern and south uh, Jersey, both Chesapeake and uh, Delaware areas. But recent new research from the, the uh, USGS suggests that this region is, that I've outlined with that bracket, is the one that's actually going to see some of the highest sea level rises in the world for a variety of reasons. The effect of that on particular places depends on the topography. But we are right at the epicenter here of, um, of rising sea levels. Now, uh, there are two points that, that I want to make about this. Uh, one is obvious. We, we're, we're talking about neighborhood preservation. We cannot plan for neighborhood preservation without taking sea level rise and climate change into account. But also, because climate change is a global problem, we can't hope to solve it at a local level. Local solutions are just not enough. And here's where that archipelago becomes really important. It's defined by risk or by threat, yes, but it also defines a network of stakeholders who all need the same solutions. Those, but those solutions cannot be local. Everyone has to work locally, of course, but the solutions need to start at the global and uh, with public policy at the global and uh, national level. And that's one other thing that, that I want to point out, that we in preservation have no solutions. This is one of the most profound problems facing our society and facing the preservation of heritage, and we have no solutions. I mention that because it defines the need that we have that, that right now as a field to come up with solutions. And it helps us to measure the distance that we have to go from where we are to where we need to be. Well, Let's navigate our way into our second version of and inequality. And it turns out we find pretty much the same situation when, when we start navigating that second archipelago. Back in the 1960s, this country was on its way to fixing poverty. There was poverty, but it was diminishing. Everyone at, and, and inequality was at, and, and the main, reason I mentioned the 1960s is that's when our preservation laws were written. So when those laws were written, 
poverty was diminishing and inequality was at the lowest it's ever been in, in this country's history, at least since the uh, 18th century. All that began to change in the 1970s, to the point where today poverty in the United States is hitting new records uh, every year. We're the richest country in the world. We have 50, roughly 50 million people living below the federal poverty level, which we all know is set too low. That's more than at any time in our history. But that's not the whole story. About one third of Americans are living either in poverty or near poverty. That means they're one third of Americans are essentially one illness away, a job loss away from, from complete uh, calamity. According to CBS News, not a, not a radical news outlet, 80% of Americans will encounter uh, poverty, hunger, inadequate food, uh, homelessness, uh, inability to pay for essential medicines at, at some point in their lives. So yes, we are a rich nation, but we've become a nation of poor people. And along the way, that this growing poverty has been accompanied by soaring inequality. And this is really infuriating. If we were all sinking in the boat together, there'd be some kind of comradeship in it. But we're not, and, and we all know we're not. America used to be a land of opportunity. Uh, most, most research on this subject shows these days that social mobility in this country now is less than in Canada, it's less than anywhere, basically in Western Europe. Uh, it, it's worse than most of the industrialized uh, nations on the planet. Our level of inequality now is comparable to that of Rwanda. Don't take it from me. Take it from the CIA. Because they're the ones who are keeping the statistics, the comparable statistics, on income inequality around the world. That's what they say. Well, you, you know the, the basic numbers. You, you've all seen graphs like this which show inequality galloping along higher and higher from year to year. Um, you, you've heard the factoids, like, the, like the, the top 3% of families, and American families now control over 50% of the national wealth. Like the fact that the six members of the Warren family have as much money as 100 million Americans, the bottom one third of Americans, you've all heard this. You've heard how the middle class is shrinking. You've heard how the country is pulling apart into two nations, rich and poor. Well, it's interesting, as a social problem, poverty shares some interesting characteristics with global warming. And one of them is it's very hard to see. We don't see global warming because the weather changes every day, and so you can't see it directly. But that's not the case with poverty. It's not hidden. But um, but I have noticed in, in talking to people in the preservation community that many of us in the preservation community really genuinely don't see it. And there is a reason for that. It's not just not caring. It's, it's that we really are separating into two nations, which is important. And we're living in the same national boundaries, but the two nations are not living in the same neighborhoods. And there's plenty of research to back this up. The research shows that since the 1970s, um, American urban neighborhoods have been increasingly segregating themselves according to uh, income. Can you hear me in the Yes. Yeah. This, this is, the, and one of the clearest demonstrations of that is a series of maps that were published in the Times based on research done by the uh, Sage Foundation about three or four years ago. And they show the changes in Philadelphia from 1970 to 90. 2007. The, the gray areas are middle income neighborhoods. The green are, are affluent with the dark green being the most affluent. The lavender and purple are poor neighborhoods with the deep purple being the poorest. And you can see a very clear trend. In 1970, the most, the large majority of the city was a, a middle income neighborhood. But by 2007, the poor neighborhoods 
and the rich neighborhoods have metastasized, and the middle income neighborhoods are just really fringes and pockets. Now, the fact that the rich neighborhoods have grown by so much, it doesn't mean that there are more rich people. It's just that the rich take up more space. <laughs> So, um, now, so, so that's, so, so that's the trend, and it's, it's broadly true in American cities. It, it, Philadelphia, it turns out, was a great choice for Matt Makers who wanted to make this point, because research shows that um, it, uh, Philadelphia was the, over this period, was the number one area for growth in income segregation in the country. And in 2007, it was the third most income segregated city in the country. So it's an extreme case. And how's Providence doing? Well, Providence comes in a respectable ninth. Um, well in the top 20, even in the top 10, among uh, cities experiencing an increase in income uh, uh, segregation. 22, over 22 percent. Well, the number, uh, yeah, um, 20, twenty-seven point four percent of Providence residents live in either poor or affluent neighborhoods today. That's a lot less than Philadelphia, where the number is forty-three percent. But it's a big jump from nineteen seventy, where the number was only five percent. So, so today, Providence is part of another archipelago of anxiety. Uh, one of the cities with high or rapidly growing income segregation. And this is some of the major cities which are uh, suffering from, from that problem. Again, it's an archipelago defined by anxiety, but it's also an indication of solid, the potential solidarity that cities and regions have in solving a national problem. Uh, now, these neighborhood changes have tremendous implications for neighborhood preservation. Think of it. In 1970, 95% of Providence residents lived in middle income or mixed income neighborhoods. It's unimaginable today. But that was the situation when our preservation laws were written and when our preservation tools were, uh, were created. So, of course, same as with global warming, of course we don't have the tools as preservationists to deal with increasingly poor neighborhoods with a spreading uh, pattern of concentrating poverty to finding more and more uh, neighborhoods. But we need those solutions now. Now, even in the 1960s, there were plenty of problems with American cities. People saw the long-term decline. And that's why we have the Urban Renewal Program, misguided though it turned out to be. But the goal was to preserve cities, uh, not to destroy them. Nonetheless, um, many of our uh, most historic cities have continued to decline uh, since then, until today, a point where population losses, which looked temporary and reversible in the 1960s, now look irreversible, permanent, irreversible, and critical. And the the, uh, the sign that we've begun to accept that, to understand that, is the word right sensing, which Donald Rinkelman used the other, uh, the other day, to indicate the idea that we have to accept that everybody's not going to come back next year. Well, the court is the poster child, as everyone knows, for this problem of shrinking cities, but the court is far from alone. I've made my own graph here of some of the uh, cities which, just a few of the many cities which have suffered long-term population decline. Chicago is the biggest. Um, Youngstown, Ohio is the bottom. You can see that Providence is the second line from the bottom. Well, you can see that a few of these cities have begun to level out. Uh, Philadelphia, maybe, uh, just recently. Providence, as we heard um, yesterday, the day before, began to level out sometime in the 1970s. 
and, and, and so today, um, Providence seems to be stable. The projection is from moderate population growth until at least, at least until, uh, 1930. As Barbara Silva pointed out yesterday, that's entirely due to immigration. And that's true across the country. It, it, it's immigrants who are, who are keeping uh, downtown core urban areas filled when they're staying filled uh, at all. Providence then is actually doing better than a lot of other island cities including East Providence and North Providence, which are shrinking and predicted to continue shrinking. So Providence and the region generally belongs to another archipelago, which is cities that have suffered or continuing to suffer uh, population declines. So why is this a problem for preservation? Well, you all know this. It's because there's, there's only one thing worse for preservation than overdevelopment, and that's underdevelopment. Meaning the withdrawal of investment from buildings and neighborhoods. And that, of course, is one of the key symptoms of population shrinkage in cities. Because when you have a, a large and growing surplus of property, you can't sell it. There's nobody who wants it. If nobody wants it, it's vacant, it's abandoned, and eventually it falls down or, or, or the city demolishes it. Um, this is the real urban preservation crisis in America today. Not downtown development, but neighborhood disinvestment. Across the country, this kind of disinvestment is claiming thousands, tens of thousands of landmark quality buildings, uh, buildings of all types, and indeed entire neighborhoods. And, and unfortunately, just as we've seen climate change, just as with poverty, we preservationists do not have the tools to solve this problem. We, uh, with, with uh, uh, brilliant consultants like John and Rettema, are showing us the best that we can do with the tools we have, the tax credits, national legacy listing, and so forth. But there's a limit to it. They're just not the right tools. They don't operate on the scale that we need to fix this problem. Uh, um, well, the fact that we don't have tools for this problem is not entirely surprising. Because in a way, it's the same problem as the poverty problem, which we also don't have tools for. We, we tend to see urban decline, this kind of thing, as, as a symptom of particular cities. It's a local problem specific to a particular city or neighborhood. So we see it as a neighborhood or a local problem. But it isn't really. It's part of, it's a manifestation of that broader pattern of growing national poverty and deepening inequality that I've already described. Because the central fact uh, about shrinking neighborhoods and shrinking cities is they're poor. They're usually also filled with people of color, but not always. The central fact is that uh, they're poor. So they are part of that broader pattern of, uh, uh, another way to look at it, is a broader pattern of growing numbers of people, including landlords, who don't have the money to maintain their buildings. And this pattern is really in, in, uh, disturbingly widespread. Uh, you see it in Chicago. No. Uh, you see it in, throughout Cleveland. No, no, no. Uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Youngstown, Ohio. Philadelphia. Uh, Baltimore. And, and on and on and on. The pattern has become so prevalent that it's not really the exception anymore. It's almost becoming a kind of rule. And, and so we can extend that concept of an archipelago of a party to include the shrinking cities, uh, as cities that are suffering from population decline as well as economic decline around the country. And I've just indicated, added a few of those to the map here. I've had uh, the opportunity to do some traveling around the country in recent years, uh, crisscrossing Southern Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Southern New England. And, and, and what has struck me increasingly is how dilapidated the, the, whole, the place looks. And, and the issue here isn't that it doesn't look pretty. The issue is that when people don't have money to maintain their houses, they're not living well. And the houses will eventually fall down because they cost more and more. Um, it, it, uh, we, you know, we hear about a crisis of 
collapsing infrastructure. But I can report to you that, the, that, that there's a much worse problem going on of collapsing houses and churches and uh, town halls and libraries and indeed whole neighborhoods. And this, gen this general deterioration, I believe, is the biggest preservation problem, apart from global warming, that we currently face. And in town after town, and city after city, the only well-maintained buildings are the dollar store and the new idol church, whether it's in Cleveland or in the countryside in uh, West Virginia. So let's begin to bring our two themes uh, back together. Global beginning, this is a term that some scientists are increasingly using that I like it because it sounds less benign than global warming. So global heating and poverty as preservation problems. And it turns out, as I've suggested, that they have a lot in common. Uh, they both uh, pose profound threats to heritage, but neither was foreseen by the framers of our preservation laws and policies. And therefore, they're not addressed by them. And as a result, we lack the tools to deal effectively with them. We can extend the similarities a bit further. They're both national, indeed global, problems. Therefore, we can't effectively solve them with only local measures. We need the local measures, but local measures alone are not enough. We must develop national and global uh, solutions. And there's one other thing that I want to add to this list. Naomi Klein has made a provocative suggestion that addressing climate change could be the way to also address a whole host of other social problems like poverty, like lack of jobs, like uh, the, the bad public transportation, like the crisis of public education, and, and, and on and on. Well, we don't need to look to Naomi Klein, as brilliant as, as that she is, for this idea. Catherine Taylor said something very similar to me when we, when we met at the beginning of this conference. She said, you know, you have to be creative. You have to look for the problem that opens up solutions. And so let's play for a minute with the, I'll call it the Klein-Taylor hypothesis <laughs> that, that looking at global warming as a problem will open up solutions not only to global warming but, uh, but, to, pro but to poverty and see if that could be true. And I want to make it clear once again that I, when, I, when I talk about global warming, ways of dealing with global warming, I don't mean building walls to keep the water out. I don't mean protecting ourselves from it. I mean what we can do to fight climate change, to bend the, temper the rising curve of temperature down, to bend the curve of rising sea level down. Of course, we know we'll have to spend billions and trillions of dollars protecting ourselves, but it's not too late to limit the scope of the problem by doing what we can to cut emissions. So the question is, What can neighborhood preservation do to bend down the curve of rising temperatures and uh, to keep the water from rising over our heads? And the answer is quite a lot. In fact, the problem of global warming cannot be solved without neighborhood preservation, and, and this is true. Despite the, um, despite the, 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 the catastrophe with ExxonMobil that we've recently learned about. There's actually a lot of good energy happening around climate change now. Just yesterday, um, the Keystone XL pipeline was, was canceled. This is huge. This is great. Um, the dis the, um, not disinvestment, the, the divestment movement is gaining traction, although it was set back by MIT's decision, I think a couple of uh, days ago. The shift to renewable energy is happening. But, but and these things are all good, um, but they're not enough. 
Think about it. If we continue to increase our energy demand, and all we do is shift the production of that energy to wind turbines and solar farms, then we're going to keep doing to the planet what we've done with oil wells and tar sands and, and fracking. We're going to continue looking at the surface of the planet as, as a thing that we can draw energy out of, and, and any other values have to give way uh, in the face of our need for energy. That that's not the future we want. So in order to make these other solutions work, the decarbonization of the economy, the shift to renewables, the divestment campaign, and so forth, we need ways to cut the energy demand. So what can neighborhood preservation do to do that, to cut the use of energy and the emission of greenhouse gases? And the answer is quite a lot. Think buildings. It turns out, a lot of people think that what we need to do is stop driving more efficient cars or whatever, but it turns out that transportation, the whole transportation sector, including trains and buses and planes and all the rest of it, is only about 20% of U.S. Uh, uh, energy-based emissions. Industry is even less. The big generator of emissions is buildings. That's, and and every, every reputable climate organization has reached the same conclusion that the building sector represents the place where we can get the biggest, deepest, quickest, and most affordable, most economically viable cuts in emissions. So that's our job then, to cut emissions from buildings. So how do we do it? Well, as we know, the, uh, the, the green building industry proposes that we build lots of new efficient green buildings and build them up with new efficient green products that the green industry is selling. Well, there is, there, there, this is not a completely crazy idea in that this is the right idea. This needs to be done in the developing world because the developing world is still growing in population, urbanization is going to increase, and standards of living need to rise. That means that the developing world does not have enough buildings. The developing world is going to need to build a lot of buildings. So they might as well be as green as, as possible. But we in the developed world, in Western Europe and especially the United States, we have our buildings. As, as the Boston lady used to say about hats, we have our hats. We have our buildings. Well, our population is not growing much. In Western Europe, it's in many parts of Western Europe shrinking. Uh, urbanization has already happened, um, and our standard of living is high enough that we do not need to buy better overall better buildings or different buildings. We have our buildings, we do not need to build new ones. So we have a real choice that we can make between demolishing the old buildings and building efficient new ones or keeping uh, the old ones. So which, which is it going to be in the United States? Well, it, it turns out that the, that the and, and this I think you probably, many of you, maybe all of you know this already, but it, the research shows that the green building, the demolish and rebuild green idea is not only wrong, but disastrously wrong. And the reason is really simple. You have that great new efficient green building, but before you can save energy by running that efficient new building, you have to build the building. And what that means is that you are putting a whole bunch of unnecessary emissions into the air in year one in order to cut down on your emissions somewhere down the line. Now what the scientists all tell us is that we have very little time to cut emissions. What they also tell us is that we cannot raise them now and then just cut them later because they don't go away. Once they're in the atmosphere, they stay there for a very long time. So we must cut them now. Not, we, not later. And what the new building strategy does is actually increase our emissions now when we need to cut them in order to lower them later when it's going to be too late anyway. How long does it take for that efficient new green building to justify the energy cost and emissions cost of its construction? 
there's been a, some research on that, not enough research, but um, the, the findings are consistent. Research that's been done in England and Canada, and the most comprehensive study done by our own National Trust a few years ago called Critics I think that's the name. And, and what, the, what the Trust found, uh, and it's consistent with all of the studies that I've seen, is that it takes anywhere from 10 to as much as 80 years for, the, for a new building to justify the initial cost of its construction. And for these two really most common of all building types, single family residential, that's the biggest chunk of our building stock in this country, and office buildings, the range is anywhere from 25 to 50 years. It's simply too late. And it's too hard to wait to make the problem worse now in order to make it better in 25 or 50 years is, is unconscionable. It's not just disastrous in the moment, it's unconscionable. So, um, so does this mean that the energy consumption, the emissions from existing buildings don't matter? Well, not exactly. The way I read this is, is, is like this. We need to keep the existing buildings in order to not make things worse, but in order to make them better, to actually lower emissions, we need to improve the existing buildings. We need to retrofit them and improve their environmental performance uh, wherever possible. And the more we can improve the environmental performance of existing buildings, and the, more, and the more we can minimize the input of materials and energy at the beginning of that process, the more we'll be able to reduce uh, emissions. So, what could this mean in policy terms? Well, it means throwing every possible obstacle in the way of new construction. If there's no longer a justification for any new construction other than what's absolutely necessary. It means a bottom-to-top review of the tax code in order to remove all the subsidies that current, the hidden subsidies that currently go to new construction and create a tax preference, fiscal preference, for rehabilitation. It means putting stiff permitting processes in place that, discuss, that make it difficult and time-consuming and expensive to, uh, to build a new building. It means anti-demolition ordinances. It means all of this. What it means, essentially, then, is a blanket across the board, nationwide, historic district designation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what it means. It means changing the default mode from where preservation has to say, this building is special, we, we, you can't demolish it, to saying, if there's nothing wrong with the building, to say, show us why your building is necessary, otherwise you can't, you can't build it. It takes a shoe and puts it on, uh, on the other foot. So you can see that this amounts to, to neighborhood preservation on a sweeping scale. We haven't even gotten to the real preservation piece, which is that we need incentives. We, we not only disincentives to build, to build new and to demolish, but incentives to preserve, to keep in use, and to and to, and to environmentally upgrade uh, the buildings that we have. So that means, uh, as I've already suggested, removing the tax penalties uh, from the essential investments in buildings that need to be made. It means finding subsidies for maintenance, and not just for the restoration of the coordinates or the this or the that, but for basic building maintenance and repair for new boilers, for roofs, uh, for paint jobs and, and the whole works. Now what I, what I want to emphasize is the, the, the huge scale of, of, of what's needed. We can do the best that possibly can be done to apply green re rehabilitation to our national treasures. And, and it doesn't make a bit of difference from a climate perspective. It, it just doesn't matter. If we want to affect the climate, we have to work not on one building, not on our national treasure, or, or two, or a hundred, but on hundreds of thousands and millions of buildings. 
whether or not they're national treasures or just ordinary old buildings. The climate doesn't care about history. It doesn't care about aesthetic value. What it cares about is carbon. And now, uh, to come back to that question that I asked earlier, or encourage you to ask, what is our heritage? What, what climate change is forcing us to do is recognize that carbon is a crucial part of our heritage. The carbon in buildings is now one of the most important things in our heritage that we need to save. Carbon, whether it's embodied in the Rhode Island State House or in that shabby three-decker in, in some neighborhood in, in who knows where. It doesn't matter, the carbon is the same. Well, to get to this kind of scale of impact on the climate, Again, local policies are simply not enough. We need broad state and uh, federal support, not only for upgrading, but also for maintaining buildings. So what that means is that the tools we have, tools that we have tax credit, national register designation, the Secretary of State, Interior Standards, and so forth, they just don't do the job. We need a deep pot of money that people can dig into for uh, basic uh, repairs and maintenance without proving significance or, uh, or integrity, without passing the national tests, uh, without submitting hugely complicated paperwork. So, yes, I'm calling for something that's become very unfashionable. I'm calling for massive public intervention in a big, shared, serious national problem. But I want to make it really clear, I'm not calling for massive public projects. I'm calling for massive support for very small private projects. Paint, boilers, caulking the windows, small stuff on an a, a extended scale that all adds up to an impact on the climate. Now, in almost closing, <laughs> let's go back to the problem of poverty and see if we can link this back in. You know, um, obviously, preservation can't eradicate poverty. But preservation can alleviate poverty. And it turns out, just as Naomi Klein uh, suggested, that a good policy for global warming is also a good policy for preservation policy uh, for, for poverty. Because the same public dollars that, uh, that can keep existing buildings standing for their carbon content can also repair and upgrade the houses of those who are to do it for themselves. So what we need is a climate policy that favors the retention and upgrading of buildings, existing buildings, configured in a way that it is also a pro-poor policy, a pro-poor preservation policy that sends the dollars first to those who economically need it most. Um, and this could be a major social pro social welfare program, one much bigger than preservation, of course. It could be a program that saves money in the long run by preserving housing and other assets that are much more expensive to replace once we've lost them, and by keeping people in their homes, which is a much cheaper solution than moving them around. Parenthetically, this also turns out to be the best policy solution for the problem of shrinking cities and disinvesting. It can't bring jobs back, at least not more than the ones in the rehabilitation that it, that it creates. And it won't fill up tens of thousands of empty homes. But it will make it possible for those who want to stay where they are to do that, and, and to do that in a somewhat level of minimum comfort. And, and that could buy us time until other more powerful economic engines of revitalization, uh, one hopes, become real someday. So now, in closing, I want to um, point out something that, that um, is, is probably obvious to you. The public policies like these, although, I've, although they address non-preservation problems, global warming, poverty, the shrinkage of cities, would be game changers for preservation. They would, put, they would take preservation off the defensive for the first time in its history. I'm sure that many of you are now thinking, well, we can't do it anyway. So what's the point of even talking about it? Let's just get back to what we're doing. But, but here's the thing. 
in the archipelagos of anxiety we are in a curious position where we can't do it, but we must do it. We must find a way to do it. The, the times are challenging us as preservationists to the very core of our professional identity. In the time when we could get by by tweaking the standards or improving the review process and changing the threshold, our record is gone. We have a much more challenging situation now. Of course, we're not going to go to the City Council or Congress and expect to get these policies implemented in the next legislative session. What I'm suggesting instead is a, is a, a long-term, broad-scale mobilization for change of a kind that we have not seen in this movement since, in 50 years, since we got the National Historic Preservation Act 50 years ago. Now again, I realize, I'm fully aware that we have a profound problem of institutional in, uh, capacity within our profession or our movement to do this. Our organizations are struggling to stay alive. Uh, the, the universities are under, under scale, the university programs and so forth. But again, we have to overcome it. We, we can't do it, but we, must, uh, but we must do it. The threat level today, I think, is high. But I think the opportunity level is at least as high. I think we're being handed an opportunity today to make meaningful change, to contribute to society in a really meaningful way, and to re-energize our own work in a way that we have not had in probably 50 years. And I hope we take it. Thank you. Terrible news for us. Right. Well, that's, great. The main, that's the main reviews, right? And 
I know. No, well, yeah. Um, but 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 that but that doesn't mean that uh, better techniques of rehabilitation couldn't eliminate. It doesn't. First of all, it doesn't mean that every conversion is uh, unsound in terms of emissions. It, it only means that some are. Uh, and probably the gap can be narrowed to better and better rehab techniques. And there's a, a wide field there for, for experimentation and, uh, and, and research. Uh, but, you know, it's there. Um, and the thing is, we should all be knowing more about this than, than we do in order to solve the problems like that. Well, I want to frame this uh, aside from the fact that So I think we need to change what we think about preservation. 
in order to in order to really do this and be good partners with others. It's not a, a, a meal of the last year of the world. I think I want to raise the issue here. 